Thanks very much, Matt. We'll now ask Paul to come and exhort us. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, uh, <coughs> Brother John, and uh, good morning, brothers and sisters, and any visitors that might be listening, young or old. This uh, past week, many of us have had the experience of a funeral conducted online and streamed to our homes. And I'm continuing what has become a tradition in our meeting, and that is streaming to you on Wi-Fi or on your telephones. Now, many of you would know the legendary difficulty I have with technology, so I hope that I don't transfer this to any of the listeners and watchers this morning. Last Sunday morning, uh, Brother Ian Russell exhorted us, and he talked about the Lord Jesus Christ as the shepherd of the sheep, and asked us the question, do you have individual time with your shepherd every day? Our shepherd provides us with still waters, he said, and will carry us on his shoulders if we have been lost. And we can have that intimate connection with our shepherd every day and with our father in prayer. Now, it almost goes without saying that if in these days of social distancing that we're practising and relative isolation in our homes, cut off from many of our daily activities, if we haven't found time to read God's word and pray every day, then perhaps we could ask ourselves, when am I likely to do this in my lifetime? unless I institute some major changes in that which I do. And so it's especially on a Sunday morning that we come together, or albeit in thought rather than bodily this morning, to remember the Lord Jesus Christ, to remember that we have been baptised into his sin-covering name, and that we are consequently brothers and sisters in Christ. Indeed, our worldwide body is called Christadelphians. Christadelphians meaning brothers in Christ. All Christian religions believe that the Bible is a special book inspired by the one true God who created all things. Many of you, like me, would wonder why are there so many different interpretations of the word of God? The message of the Bible should be understandable, it should make sense, and it should present a consistent message, both in Old and New Testament, to us. It's a source of wonder to me that Christadelphians should have such a different interpretation of scriptures to many other uh, Christian bodies. And our interpretation, of course, is summarised in the BASF and in Australia with the addition of the Cooper Carter Addendum. Naturally, we all believe that our interpretation is the correct one, for nobody would willingly believe a lie. Now, amongst those many differences that Christadelphians have with other de denominations is our understanding of the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Most Christian denominations believe that Jesus Christ has always existed and he's part of a trinity made up of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. That he came to earth as God incarnate or invested in human form. Other groups, uh, such as uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, even um, Sir Isaac Newton, believed that Jesus Christ was the very first of God's creation, even before he created the heavens and the earth. 
and they are following the beliefs of one Arius, who was a man who lived in Turkey uh, in the third century AD. Thus, if they believe that if Jesus was created, he therefore was not eternal. The Christadelphians don't believe either of these uh, about the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've confessed this belief before our, we were baptised into his sin-covering name, that Jesus Christ was in God's plan from eternity. But he had no bodily or physical existence before he was born of Mary, as recorded in the Gospels. Jesus, uh, God was his father and Mary was his mother. And as a consequence of that, he suffered the same human weaknesses that we all have. But he never once disobeyed his father and committed a sin. Now this view of the Lord Jesus Christ is unique. We are a small group on the world stage. There may be others who have a similar view about the Lord Jesus Christ, but they too would be small in number. I want you to have a look at the book of Hebrews where the Apostle Paul spells this out to us. And we'll start in chapter 2 of Hebrews and look at verse 17. Chapter 2 and verse 17, and all my readings this morning will be from the NIV translation. For this reason... He had to be made like his brothers in every way. This is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. In order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. And that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So there was a suffering associated with the temptations that Jesus had. And yet he never once gave in to those temptations. If we turn over to chapter 4 and verse 15, there we read... For we do not have a high priest who is, is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. So Paul is saying we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our situation. And he's been tempted in every way like you and I yet without sin. Now these uh, words of the Apostle Paul uh, provide great comfort to me and I'm sure they do to you because our Heavenly Father knows my weaknesses and yours also. Now that lovely picture that uh, Brother Ian presented last week about Jesus growing up learning about sheep, perhaps from the shepherds who were there at his birth, uh, learning carpentry from his stepfather, sharing family life with his mother and brothers and sisters, taking over family responsibility when Joseph, his stepfather, died early. We saw Jesus as a, a, a real person. And if we turn back to uh, Luke chapter 2, and these are words that we know very well, but uh, they're worth reading again. We read a little about that is recorded about the early life of the Lord Jesus. And there is only a very little. We read in uh, Luke chapter 2 and verse 40, And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So here was a special child. He was full of wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Every year his parents went to 
Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And we know the story how Jesus was left behind for three days by his parents as they travelled back to Nazareth. And uh, when they came back to find him, he said, he said to them, verse 49, Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? He had to be in his father's house. But they did not understand what he was saying to them. The last verse in chapter 2 of Luke. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. So here was a precocious but not an obnoxious child growing up in favour with God and with men. Now that's really the only record we have of Jesus' life until his ministry commenced at about the age of 30. We can only guess what may have occurred. For the next uh, inspired account of uh, his life occurs in chapter 3 of Luke. And uh, verse 21 records the time when he was baptised by John the Baptist. In verse 21, when all the people were being baptised, Jesus was baptised too. And you and I have been baptised as commanded. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. So that was a very powerful and moving occasion and must have impressed the people that were there on the banks of the Jordan at that time. But what did this anointing with the Holy Spirit do for Jesus? Well, the Apostle Paul, Peter says in uh, Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, God appointed Jesus of Nazareth, he anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And he went around doing good and healing all those who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. And so as a result of the Holy Spirit, uh, being anointed with the Holy Spirit, he was able to perform miracles. He was able to heal the sick. And as we've read this morning in John's Gospel, he was able to raise the dead. What else could he do? Well, if we turn back to uh, Luke chapter 11, uh, or turn forward to Luke uh, chapter 11, we'll see. Luke chapter 11 and verse 17. And Jesus dealing with the... Uh, uh, Pharisees and uh, it says Jesus knew their thoughts he knew their thoughts he knew what these men were thinking and said to them uh, if a kingdom is divided against itself it will be ruined and a house divided against itself will fall but what a huge temptation would present itself to the Lord Jesus he could interact with someone and know their thoughts. Just think of uh, potentially being able to take advantage of anyone, male or female. But of course, he resisted that temptation throughout his entire life. Well, the other thing about the Lord Jesus Christ is he obviously had a photographic memory. And once he'd read a passage in the Old Testament... He could recall that and did so on regular occasions. So for those three and a half years of his ministry, he led the life of a, an itinerant preacher, leading a band of 12 disciples, and there were, of course, many other followers, and preaching to the inhabitants of the land of Israel, friend and foe. He was preaching the good news of God's coming kingdom, the gospel message. Now, it was a very hard life. He was in constant argument with the Jewish authorities. 
He was sleep deprived. He often spent many hours at night praying to his father. And basically, he was homeless. He had friends at, in whose house he could occasionally stay, but he says in Luke 9 verse 58, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. No place to lay his head. So perhaps uh, in these current times we're thinking how tough our life is. When we, at uh, obeying government directives, we are confined to our homes, where we have a roof over our head. We have three meals a day. We have a nice warm bed to sleep in. It is this itinerant preacher, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour, who we come to remember this morning and to compare our lives of service with his. If we go over to Luke chapter 13, we'll see that Jesus, just like us, could be disappointed. In uh, Luke uh, chapter uh, 13, he, he's disappointed uh, in verse 34. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. That was a great disappointment to the Lord Jesus Christ. We turn over to John chapter 2. We'll see he expresses another emotion that you and I have. Luke, uh, John chapter 2 and uh, verse 15. Well, we'll go to verse 16. To those who sold the doves, this is Jesus in the tem uh, temple uh, area. To those who sold doves, he said, Get those out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? He was very angry with the fact that there was so much commerce going on inside the temple grounds. So there we are. He was disappointed. He was angry. It's interesting. It was ne it's never recorded of Jesus that he laughed or he was happy. His mission was to overcome sin in his own life, to be the saviour of mankind. And that was a serious mission. It was, in fact, a matter of life and death. So if we come now to the uh, reading in John chapter 11, we just look at a quick verse in chapter 10 and verse 40. It says, Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptising in the early days. Here he stayed and the people came to him. So he had fled from Judea because the authorities were out to get him. And he'd gone to the place where, in fact, uh, John had been baptising. Perhaps he had been baptised in those early days. he received a message that Lazarus was sick. And there he was with his group at least 25 kilometres from Bethany. Verse 6 of chapter 11 tells us that instead of rushing to uh, help Lazarus, yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. So the conversation then goes between he and his disciples about Lazarus sleeping. But in verse 14, Jesus tells them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there. So that you may believe, believe that he is the promised Messiah. But let us go to him. So you wonder, how did Jesus know that Lazarus was dead? Perhaps this was part of uh, the gift. Perhaps he'd been uh, in prayer uh, with his father and received an answer uh, that Lazarus was, in fact, now dead. 
other than being, he'd progressed from being sick to, to dead. And so they made the uh, long walk to Bethany and Thomas reluctantly said, let us go that we may die with him. He knew what the dangers were. The, the walk to uh, Bethany could have taken them two days because uh, verse 17 of uh, John 11 tells us that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Verse 21, Martha comes to Jesus. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he'll rise again at the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, Martha said. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. So this was uh, interesting, this interaction with Martha, wasn't it? It was a very intellectual discussion. And, and many of us have uh, an intellectual appreciation of God's word and our faith is based on this. We like to seek out every last jot and tittle of God's word to build up our faith. Jesus was able to discuss quite easily with her at an intellectual level the hope of resurrection. But then Mary came out to meet him and in verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, how he loved him. So here was a very emotional Jesus now, faced with the sight of the weeping Mary and her companions. He obviously had exactly the same feelings that you and I have. We might remember some 18 months previously that Jesus also raised someone else from the dead. Jesus and his disciples had come to a town of Nairn and as they did so, the funeral of a young man was being conducted. And this was uh, much more like a random event that occurred. The young man was the only child of uh, a woman who was now a widow. And uh, perhaps we could look at it in John, uh, in, sorry, in Luke chapter seven, the, the story of the uh, young man who'd uh, passed away, and his mother, with a large crowd following him out to be buried. Uh, Luke chapter seven and uh, verse thirteen. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, "Don't cry." Don't cry. Verse 14, Then he went up, touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The young man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Can we just imagine the emotion that was associated with that event as well? The thoughts in that mother's heart as she saw her, her dead son now sitting up and speaking to her. Now, as I say, it just seems like a random event, but a particularly touching one. Now, perhaps Jesus was suddenly and unexpectedly looking ahead to his crucifixion when his widowed mother would be mourning the death of her son on the cross. And so it is that whether our faith is intellectual, or whether our faith is an emotional one, or whether it's a mixture of both, we can see the humanity of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was like you and me, except that his life 
was untainted by sin. But certainly, as we've read, he could sympathise with our weaknesses because he too had felt them but had overcome them. And so we come to April 26, 2020, with Australia and indeed the whole world in the midst of a health crisis that can potentially affect us all. And along with it, an economic crisis which is going to affect the world for many, many years or as long as it lasts. Men and women, young and old, are feeling very vulnerable, conscious of their mortality. And at the same time, moth and rust is destroying our economy. We might be wrestling with despair. Why me? Why is this happening? Where's God? Why is he allowing this to happen? As our jobs are lost, as our finances dwindle. Now, crises such as this, that uh, we definitely have a crisis on our hands, pandemic, have faced the world many times before. In the 6th century, in the time of the Emperor Justinian, between, it's estimated between 25 and 100 million people in Europe died of the plague, the Black Plague. Now, in the 14th century, another 25 million people in Europe died. And it's estimated that 75 million people at the same time perished in Asia, perished from the Black Death as it came to be known. So pandemics have come and gone and yet each time they have shaped world history with what they have uh, presented to the inhabitants of the world. And the facts are that, as we read this morning, Jesus let Lazarus die. The benefit of his death was that many of the Jews visiting Mary and Martha believed that Jesus had been sent from God and they put their faith in him. And so it is with the current pandemic that God has a purpose with this earth. It will be filled with his glory. And so there's a purpose, whatever it is, there's a purpose in this current situation. Men will realise that they are not as clever as they think they are. Young people may be thinking, I should really consider following the Lord Jesus Christ and being baptised. So God's purpose is bigger than all this and we can be involved with God's purpose. We can be involved if we determine to follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we come together week by week. And though even separating physically by events, we still share a wonderful common hope that Jesus expressed to Martha. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And in another place, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so, brothers and sisters, we come together now in thought as we take the bread and the wine in remembrance of the Lord Jesus. Many of us are weary and many of us are carrying heavy burdens, but the promise is there. We can leave our lives in God's care, trusting that whatever happens to each of us is in accordance with his will and purpose. The Lord Jesus Christ has shown the way. How fortunate we are to have been chosen to follow him. How fortunate we are that we can have our sins forgiven. How fortunate we are that we can share the burdens of this life with him.